Thank you guys for having me today. Okay, um, so I basically want to talk about discriminants. So, I just want to start with a uh, quadratic equation. And, uh, okay, so we know that the roots, everybody knows the quadratic formula. So uh, this number in here we call the discriminant, right? Maybe I'll use so this definition. Probably everybody here knows this. Uh, probably called that because whether this is a uh, well, for instance, if this is negative, then you have imaginary roots, right? Etc. Okay. So, this is the question I want to talk about. So, let delta be an integer. What are the possible polynomials? AX squared plus BX plus C uh, with A, B, and C integers. Such that B squared minus 4AC. Okay. In other words, I want to classify polynomials with a given value for the discriminant. Okay. Uh, in the sort, by the way, um, pretty much everything that I'm talking about can be found in an appendix called delta equals b squared minus 4ac in this book, Introduction to Number Theory by Flaith. Uh, the appendix is actually written by Sayre. Anyway, he mentions that um, this question goes back to Gauss around 1800. Uh, probably people were interested in this. Uh, earlier than that, but I guess it was Gauss that had the first really good ideas about how to answer this question. So, um, anyway, uh, I guess there's two the things. One is existence. In other words, uh, can I? Is there any? And then the other one would be, if there are any, how many? You know, for a given delta. Okay. So let's talk about existence. That will be the easy part. So uh, if I have this, so here's a fact. Then delta has to be uh, 0 or 1, mod 4. Okay. Somebody tell me why that's true. I'm going to have some audience interaction today. Yeah, so uh, if you look at this, delta is, is equal to b squared. So a square plus a multiple of 4, which means that if I reduce mod 4, it's a square. And you can go ahead and check that 0 and 1 are squares mod 4. And then that 2 and 3 are not squares mod 4. So OK. Does that make sense to everyone? Because mod 4, yeah. Okay. So in, in other words, this means delta is 4 times an integer, or delta is 4 times an integer plus 1. OK. This is the integer. Uh, sorry. Well, anyway. Uh, what I just said didn't make sense. Sorry. <laughs> OK. So. claim if delta is congruent to 0 or 1 mod 4, then there is some ax squared plus bx 
plus c with discriminant delta. Okay. So, in other words, everything that's 0 or 1 mod 4 does have at least one solution. And, uh, well, you could just sit there and phone. This is quite easy to check, uh, but maybe I won't really go through all the work right now, but just to notice that if I look at uh, something that looks like x squared plus or minus 2x plus 1 minus k, the discriminant of that uh, will come out to be 4k. And the discriminant of something like x squared plus or minus x minus k, I think I wrote this out correctly, would be 4k plus 1. So anyway, so you could just check these things. I mean, I, I just came up with these. My, I mean, basically, I mean, how did I go about doing this? I just decided, OK, let's make a equal 1. And then uh, figure out a convenient thing to make either b or c. I can't remember how I did it. And the other one fell out. I mean, it was obvious what it had to be. So this is, yeah, so everything. Every number that's either 0 or 1 mod 4, I can find some sort of polynomial. And it's not even going to be a very ugly polynomial that has that for the discriminant. Stop, at any, stop me at any time if you guys have any uh, questions. I want this to be really clear. Um, OK. So we always have this. OK. This is going to be the, the hard part. Well, the first answer to how many is a lot because, uh, well, let's say I have something like this. And then let's say I want to look at that. Anybody want to guess about a remarkable fact that these two functions would have in common? Yeah. OK. so. Um, yeah, they have the same discriminant. So, uh, and of course, I could have just so that basically translate. It means like translating my function to the left. Uh, so you could translate it to the left or right by any integer, according to this, and see that you get the same discriminant. Um, so obviously, there's infinitely many. So we need to, uh, if we're going to hope to actually have some counting going on, we should uh, revise the question a little bit. So. OK. So exercise. How about? Okay. OK. So basically, uh, now I want to go from looking at ax squared plus bx plus c to ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared. Uh, I mean, taking the, these kind of things are in correspondence. I just stick a y here and a y squared there here. And going from here to here is like replacing y with 1. Uh, this seems to make things more symmetric and easier to talk about. But the discriminant of something like this is still uh, b squared minus 4ac. Okay. Uh, this is called a binary quadratic form. Uh, binary because it has two variables, and quadratic because it's a homogeneous quadratic polynomial. <laughs> and um, we'll say integral binary quadratic form because the coefficients are always going to be integers. That's because this is a number theory talk. Okay, so. <laughs> Um, right, so what this, OK, so when up here I had sort of the operation of taking x to x plus 1, here that's like uh, taking x and replacing it with x plus y. Of course, y is you know, going from here to here is like making y be 1, right? And uh, 
and not changing y. Okay, in other words, this is like taking xy and multiplying it times 1101. One, Does that seem right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so basically, I can think of any, any 2 by 2 matrix, I can apply it to this and get a new form by just multiplying the, you know, replacing x with, you know, what, you know, whatever this is, you know, replace x with x prime and y with y prime. Does this make sense? So, yeah, so what else doesn't change the discriminant? Uh, well, if I look at the formula, switching A and C doesn't change the discriminant, right? Okay, which corresponds, when I think about the variables, to switching x and y, right? And so, uh, let me see, try to have this written down as concisely as possible. Yeah, well, so in other words, if I think about, uh, so I'm gonna call this matrix something. Okay, I'm gonna call it S. Okay, uh, if I switch X and Y and do this same kind of thing, I'm talking about um, X staying the same and Y going to X plus Y. Okay, so this is like taking my vector and multiplying it times probably the transpose. Okay. So, in other words, these are two matrices that I can multiply by x and y and not change the discriminant. Okay, so I guess any matrix I could get by, well, also, also these are invertible, so the inverses of these matrix, matrices, and anything that I could get by combining these w would also not change the discriminant. So in other words, I want to talk about the group that is generated by these. Um, it, not important if you don't know what I mean by that, but does anybody know what that group would be? Okay. Well, it turns out it's SL2Z. So this means all matrices. Oh, it doesn't matter. With. Uh, determinant one. Everything's an integer. Okay. Hello. Okay. Alpha, delta, minus, beta, gamma, that would be the determinant of that matrix. I want that to be one. Okay. Um, so this acts on, I'll just, uh, abbreviate integral binary quadratic forms fixing the discriminant. Meaning, if I, multi if I take any matrix like this and I act on a form like this, I get a new form, I replace x and y with whatever and then I simplify it, okay, that thing has the same discriminant. So now, yeah. I want to ask a different question, so a better question. Would be classify the SL2Z equivalence classes binary quadratic forms ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared with b squared minus 4ac so given a delta okay. 
So in, what do I mean by equivalence classes? I mean, I don't want to count something twice if I can get from one to the other by multiplying by a matrix like this. Okay. And other, for, you know, specifically, I don't want to count a form twice if one of them is just the other one translated over. Those guys have the same discriminant. So. Okay. So, um, let's say count. <laughs> okay. So, let H underline of delta equal this number. I guess I haven't said, for all you know, this number is infinite, but so I'm going to use H underline of delta for the for that number. Okay. <coughs> so case number one. And we're not going to get to case two today. <laughs> okay. Uh, negative discriminant. So uh, that means if I think back to my original polynomial, that it has uh, complex roots, right? Uh, because I had to take the square root of a negative to find the roots of that polynomial. So, right. Um, so let me. So for the rest of the talk, the discriminant's negative. Let's see. Well, so if I had, something like that, I could factor out an A, and then I could go ahead and factor this, and it would look something like that. Uh, I'm, I, I would think to put minuses there so that tau and tau bar would be the roots, but I'm trying to stick closely to the thing that I was getting this talk from, so there's a plus sign there. <laughs> anyway, uh, so minus tau and minus tau bar would be the roots. I guess uh, you can look at the quadratic formula and know that, so bar means complex conjugate, and yeah, the roots of a polynomial come in conjugate pairs. I, I think that's pretty easy to see from the quadratic formula in this case. Uh, probably most of you guys know that anyway. Okay. So, um, but if I think about the quadratic form, this I'm factoring this as uh, like this. Okay. And then I might as well take tau to have positive imaginary part. OK. So basically, yeah. OK. Otherwise, this one has positive imaginary part. All right. So what I'm going to do is think about how multiplying by one of those matrices in SL2Z uh, affects this, I'm going to think about what it does to tau. OK. Uh, because that's going to help me visualize what I'm talking about. Um, OK. So this is not going to seem motivated, but I'll give you a picture that explains why this is a good idea. So a form. This is a form, quadratic form, is almost reduced if A is less than or equal to C and the absolute value of B is less than or equal to A. OK. So let's get a picture of what that looks like. I'll come over here. OK. Well, let me stay over here for a second. <laughs> so what is the relationship between A, B, and C and tau? OK, I can see it right here that uh, B is what? 
uh, tau plus tau bar. Right? Uh, times A. And then uh, C is tau times tau bar times A. Right? Just by foiling this out and seeing what the coefficients are. OK. So if A is less than or equal to C, oh yeah. So let's say that A and C are both positive. The I mean, you can look at either A and C are both positive or A and C are both negative. It's not going to be, it's not going to matter which one, but we might as well take A and C to both be positive. So if A is less than or equal to C, right, what does that mean? Uh, well, look at this. It means that this number is uh, bigger than 1, right? Uh, I guess, yeah, this is a, a real number. OK, you multiply a number by its conjugate, you get a real number. Right, actually, so this tells me that tau tau bar is greater than or equal to 1. OK, what is this, actually? Somebody tell me. That's right. <laughs> of course, so I can get rid of the square. So this is only going to be true if and only if the absolute value of tau is bigger than or equal to 1. So if I just think about where tau is, so here's my, this is my complex plane. This is imaginary part, my real part. So. Not so pretty, but OK. I need to be outside. So I, I'm only looking at the top half of the complex plane because I am talking about just the, I'm just going to look at the positive root. It's got to be outside this circle, right? OK, great. And then for this one, uh, I think it means that tau plus tau bar has to be, well, the absolute value of it. Less than or equal to 1? Does that look OK? OK. This is twice so tau. Twice the real part of tau, right? You just, if you haven't had complex numbers before, I mean, a, a complex number is here. Its conjugate is right here. When you add them up, it's like adding these vectors. You get something which is twice as far over here on the real. So adding a number to its complex conjugate gives you twice the real part. OK. So this means that the absolute value of the real part is less than or equal to 1 half. In other words, I'm in there. OK. Uh, yeah, so I, so com taking those two conditions mean that I'm living here. OK. So why would I care about that? Um, you could do this. Well, if you're interested in this, I recommend sort of playing with it with actual matrices. But basically, this I can think of SL2Z acting on my space of forms. But I could just look at what it does to tau to see what's happening. And when I apply S, which was 1, 1, 0, 1, what happens? Tau moves to the left. I guess if I apply S inverse, it moves to the right by an integer. So let's say I'm right here. And I want to land in here. I'll move to the left a bunch until I'm right here, say. OK, but now I'm, I don't want to be there. So I could do. Uh, I could invert myself. <laughs> Why would I want to do that? Because, uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. 
this corresponds to inverting tau, and it has determinant 1, so it's in the group. Okay. When I say invert, I mean just do 1 over it. 1 over this is going to be somewhere over here, then maybe I bounce over there. Okay, so exercise. <laughs> if I apply these matrices or their inverses a finite number of times, I can take anything and land it in here. Okay, and so I might as well only need to count stuff that satisfies that, is what I'm saying, because everything else is going to be equivalent to one of those. But I want to get a good count. I want to make sure that I can't take something in here and move it to something else. Okay, and the only double counting I'm going to get is here. If I move over one to the left, I'm going to be on the boundary. So I want to delete this boundary. Okay, so let's see. Okay. Or if I'm down here and I invert myself, I'm going to land right here. Okay. So I guess I'm assuming a little bit of knowledge about what happens when you invert complex numbers visually. But okay, so I I like to delete this part of the boundary there. Okay. So can you guys see what this looks like? So I'm including the boundary here and here but I'm not including the boundary there and there. Okay, so this is an important picture. <laughs> if you want to get into number theory, you'll probably see it in other contexts too. Okay, uh, this would be called the fundamental domain for the action of SL2Z on the half plane, I think, because fundamental domain meaning that there's exactly one equivalence class uh, inside there for each thing in the plane. Yeah. So, right. Okay. Any questions? So, let me get to the fun stuff. Okay. So, here's a theorem. There are only finitely many uh, sorry <coughs> almost reduced hence reduced oh so did I I didn't I didn't uh, so reduced. if tau is in here. <laughs> okay. I mean, there's a equivalent definition of, uh, there's an equivalent definition that looks like this, but it just takes a couple lines. It's like, if they're equal, then I need to, whatever. I mean, this, this picture is all you need to know. Okay. That's what reduced means. Uh, but anyway, almost reduced forms with, uh, what was it, b squared minus 4ac. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I probably do want to go through this. So, so let's say, so I've got a less than or equal to c and absolute value of b less than or equal to a. All right. Well, so what, let's see here. I got 4ac equals b squared minus delta, if I just rearrange this equation. All right. Well, I should know that 4ac, since a is less than or equal to c, if I replace c with a, this is going to get smaller. Okay, and on this side, if I replace B with A, this is going to get bigger. Does that seem clear? Right. So if I just look at this inequality here, I get, uh, move this A squared here, I'm going to get 3A squared less than or equal to delta. 
which means there's only finitely many choices of what A can be, right? I mean, I gotta pick a positive number such that 3A squared is less than delta. There's only finitely many of those, okay? But once that's true, then there's only finitely many things B can be because its absolute value has to be less than A. And once I know what A and B are, and I know what delta is, then I can just solve for C so I know what C is, okay? So not only does that tell me that there's only finitely many, but it tells me exactly how to go about finding all of them, okay? So this is a, if you did that, you might start making a table like that. So in other words, you know, you would just look at all the possible A's with 3A squared less than or equal to delta. There's not gonna be many of those. Then you're gonna look at B's, which absolute value is less than or equal to A, and then you won't have any choice as to what C is. So you might start making a table. You like do an exhaustive search. I copied this out of this book here. Um, something you might, so, so here I'm getting a good count of how many there are. Um, as you can see, the number's not all that big for w when you are getting started. Um, something you might notice, this guy right here is just two times, where is it, this one? Okay, and uh, that doesn't seem all that fun, so I'm gonna exclude that, okay? So let's see. A form is primitive if A, B, and C have no common factor. Okay, so uh, I wouldn't want to count this guy. He's not primitive, okay? I, I mean, I was able to factor out a two from everything. All right, so the, the number that is really of interest to us would be So the number of whatever with primitive in there. <laughs> okay. The number of the things I was counting before, but I want to insist that they're primitive, so the number's going to go down. Okay. So Okay. Right, so you might want to take a look at this table here. So these are tables of values of H. This is what I passed out. If you guys want to, I mean, not important to take all this information in. Um, I should point out, so, so this is the kind of thing Gauss was looking at, I think, in the eight, around 1800. Uh, He wasn't too interested in, um, well, like, for example, so, so he was interested in, for one thing, finding all the, f uh, the, by the way, H is called the class number. Okay, I'm gonna keep using that word. The class number of delta, okay. He wanted to find all the deltas with class number one, uh, but he only wanted to use deltas that were fundamental. So, means not a square times some other delta. So like for instance, uh, 27 equals three times nine 28 equals, uh, well here, I guess I should put negatives here. Negative four times, or I should say negative seven times four. Okay, so like if you look on here, uh, negative 27 and negative 28 show up on there, but I don't think 
Well, I, I, I guess I could get into why this is true, but I, I don't, why we would only care about fundamental discriminants. 27 is, is negative 3, which already appeared on that table, times 9, which is a square. 28 is negative 7, which already appeared on this table, times 4, which is a square. Okay, so these things are basically end up being redundant. So maybe this table would have been, had more concise if, he, if the person that made it, which wasn't me, had left out things like that. But at any rate, um, so th those are at least of the ones that have class number one, those are the only ones that aren't fundamental on this chart. So if you look at this and you ignore those two, you're going to find nine that have a one in them. Of course, this chart isn't finished. It could go on forever. So uh, around 1800, Gauss conjectured that there were, that there were no more. Um, and I guess what makes this talk exciting is, if you think this kind of thing is exciting, is that uh, that was proved that he was correct over 150 years later, but it, that, that took some time. Um, uh, so, yeah, he found this, let's see, look on here in the second column, kind of near the bottom, negative 163 is the last one that Gauss could find that had a class number one, and it turns out it's the last one there is, but uh, that was difficult to, figure out. Um, so, let's see. I definitely want to talk about 163. I guess, um, so for those of you who might know something about algebraic number theory, you probably heard about a class number that is something else. And I guess I should say that if delta is a fundamental discriminant, this equals the class number of the field Q adjoined square root of delta. So this quadratic number field. Um, at, the reason for that is you can, so if you have an element of this group, so this is a, uh, this is the size of a group of ideal classes of the ring of integers of that number field. Uh, if I have one of those ideals, I can send it to a quadratic form and I can check that two, quadra two things will get sent to equivalent forms in this sense if and only if they represented the same ideal class in the class group. Uh, so there's actually, because of that, there's a natural abelian group structure on the set uh, on these things that we're trying to count, the equivalence classes of quadratic forms with a given discriminant. Uh, apparently, Gauss discovered that group structure, although uh, this was before the word group existed. Um, so I don't know in what sense it, it was the case that he understood what that group structure was. Much less, so it, this was probably like, uh, well, I have this stuff written down here. Let's see. So this was definitely like 20 years before the first time the word group was used. And uh, more than 50 years before this group, the class group of a number field, was defined. Uh, so apparently Gauss had some good ideas, but anyway. So uh, negative 163 is kind of cool. So here's something. So Euler, everyone's favorite dude, in uh, 1772, he wrote this letter to Bernoulli where he noticed the following thing about this polynomial. So he was interested in x squared plus x plus 41. And uh, so here's the table of just the values of this function. And if you plug in 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Let's go up to 39 here. OK. So I'll go ahead and plug these in for you. You get 41, 43, 47, 53, 61, 71, 83. Uh, hold on. Not 67, 83, 97. Uh, out here you get 1,601. Anybody notice anything about those numbers? Yeah, how did you know? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so these are all prime. Uh, I could call this f of x. Uh, f of 40 
is uh, not prime. Actually, it's pretty easy to see why it's not prime. I can't remember off the top of my head. I guess that's 40 squared plus 40 plus 41. It's like something else squared. I don't know. I just, anyway, it's not prime. Um, so by the way, what's the discriminant of this? Any guesses? Yeah. And uh, so it turns out that this kind of thing happens when you look at polynomials whose uh, discriminant has class number one. I guess if you know algebraic number theory, I think that's saying that the, uh, that the polynomial splits over a quadratic extension with class number one. So um, I guess here's a theorem I'm not going to prove. But so if p is prime, how do I do it on time? Okay. Congruent to 3 mod 4. Uh, is that what I want? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I want. Sorry. Then the following are equivalent. H of minus P equals 1. OK, so P here, I'm going to be thinking about 163. Uh, and I just found out or by looking at this table that H of negative 163 is 1. So I have that. And B says that x squared plus x plus p plus 1 over 4. In this case, p plus 1 over 4 is 41. So uh, is prime for x all the way up to p minus 7 over 4. So uh, in this case, that takes you up to 39. I'll just see. So, and then there's another one down here which is basically saying that you only have to check that the first few are prime, and then all the rest of them will be prime up to this. But that only happens when you plug in something with class number one. Uh, so you could prove this. There's nice proof of it. So this is an, an elementary kind of book that has a lot of stuff about this. I found some proofs of some related things in this book with no cover. Elementary and Analytic Theory of Algebraic Numbers by Narkievich, which is a great book. Anyway. There's a proof of this theorem in there. Um, yeah, so that's something that is neat about things with class number one. I guess uh, you know finding primes is something people have been interested in since way before Euler's days, even. And Euler found a neat way of finding a bunch of primes here. I guess he was, you know, but unfortunately, there's not going to be a quadratic with uh, that does better than this. I think, according to what we now know. Um, OK, that's not a precise statement, but. So something else. This doesn't quite work to be an interactive thing that you guys could get out your calculators and do, but. So I'll, I'll just pretend that uh, I had a scientific calculator. They gave me a lot of digits, and I wanted to plug in this number. All right, just put this number in my calculator, and I wanted to look at the, you know, decimal approximation of this number. Okay, so it equals. Mm -hmm. It's a big number, unfortunately. So it actually, apparently, did I write this down? I hope I did. I found this on uh, 
anyway, I was reading about this on Wikipedia actually, and apparently appeared in, I think, Scientific American in 1975, uh, the April Fool's Day issue. Somebody put that this was an integer, uh, which I guess if you somehow figured out what the integer part of it was and subtracted that off uh, and then stuck it in your calculator, if your calculator only gave you 12 digits of precision, because uh, there's 12 nines there, then you would think it was an integer too. Um, and in the appendix that I keep referring to of that number theory book, uh, Sarah gives an outline for a proof that is above my head at the moment because I don't know anything about uh, modular functions. But uh, for why you could know just because the class number of this is 1, uh, but yet this number is so big that basically you're going to get this by evaluating some power series where the, because the class number is 1, the first couple terms are integers. And then you can just look at the rest of the terms, and they all are extremely small. So there's a way of seeing why this being so close to an integer is, uh, is because the class number is 1. But anyway, right. Isn't that neat? No? Yeah, OK. Uh, <laughs> so OK. I guess I'll spend the rest of the time, because this I'm not going to prove anything here, uh, talking about uh, the problem of determining all the fields with class number 1, which, as I said, Gauss was right. There were only nine of them. Or I should say, all the fundamental discriminants with class number 1. Um, negative. OK, that's important. There, it, there's another table like this with positive ones. And you know, there's a bunch of those that have class number 1, too. Um, Anyway, so basically, if you look at this table, maybe some of you guys have already started analyzing the asymptotics of this table. Uh, you'll notice that h of delta is sort of roughly like growing like the absolute value of delta, the square root of that. So um, people notice that anyway. Uh, I guess you can get an upper bound I'm not sure how you get this, but apparently it's an easy thing to, to prove h of delta less than three absolute value to the one half log okay, but what I would really like I want a lower bound like this. Um, right, because if I knew that h of delta was less than or equal to something that went off to infinity, in other words, I want to know that uh, that when delta gets big, h has to get big too. So that after a certain point, I can say it has to at least be bigger than one. That would be the point of this. Or if you wanted to count stuff with class number two, you'd like to say that at a certain point it was bigger than two, etc. So. Uh, Basically, getting asymptotics on h of delta in terms of delta is what people spent a long time trying to do. Um, I mean, it was definitely over 100 years after Gauss first made his conjecture that anybody had any ideas of, about this, as far as I am aware. Um, so, uh, well, so let's see here. This is a timeline, I guess. Gronwall and Landau, well, they weren't working together, but putting together some of their stuff. So this is from 1913, and this was 1918. Uh, they showed that, well, they needed something a lot weaker than this, but basically, if the generalized Riemann hypothesis is true, okay, something a little weaker than that is what they really needed, but. So for those of you who don't know, this is a very difficult thing to prove that is, you would win a million dollars today if you proved it. So it's still not true. Still not proven to be true. Anyway, um, so using that, they got a bound. Like this. At any rate, this goes to infinity. So, um, And this is a constant that you could compute if you wanted to. 
So that would be nice if it wasn't conditional on the GRH. But and I'm not really sure about what the methods of that are, but anyway. Um, so let's see here. Heilbronn in 1934, he proved that the limit as delta approaches minus infinity h of delta. Okay. Um, I'm not sure exactly how he proved this or if he got an effective estimate like that. I don't think he did. But what, what does that tell you? It tells you that for any num number like 1, 2, 3, et cetera, there's only, there can only be finitely many uh, things. Yeah, so um, of course, for all we knew, there was a billion really big numbers that all had h of delta equal 1 that were just so big that we hadn't computed them yet. Um, but that was not so. So in 1936, um, you have Ziegel, who's a, a big deal. Anyway, uh, so he showed that given epsilon greater than zero, there exists a constant depending on epsilon such that h of delta is greater than or equal to that constant times delta to the 1 half minus epsilon. So um, this is really great. Uh, the unfortunate, although if you think things like this are cool, you might think that not be sad about it. But the thing is that his proof is, uh, doesn't actually tell you how to construct this constant. And it's a sort of example, I guess, of what you call uh, a non-constructive proof. The proof sort of ends up giving you a contradiction if you assume that there are two deltas which have a class number smaller than this side here. Uh, and well, so as a result of that, it was, I don't know if I'm explaining this very well, but it was proved that other than the nine fields that Gauss already found, or I keep saying fields, other than the nine negative discriminants that Gauss already found having class number one, there could be at most one more that we hadn't found. But it, he wasn't able to prove that there wasn't another one. Uh, that wasn't proved. I'm running out of time, so I'll maybe stop writing for a minute. But uh, I guess in 1952, Hagner, uh, well, I should, I should write people's names if I'm talking about them, uh, proved that there was no 10th thing with class number one. Uh, but I think people were extreme. This is, by the way, a really famous paper in which I just learned uh, last week. Somebody was talking about various other things that were included in that paper. But um, it wasn't until uh, sometime later, I guess uh, the 60s, that uh, somebody came up with a proof that people weren't complaining about. So apparently there was something fishy about this. I think this had stuff to do with modular forms and I don't know, I won't get into it. Um, so Stark, 1967, uh, finished the job. So anyway, this is like the Hagner-Stark theorem or something. I don't know. Is, do people call it that? Yeah, OK. Um, right. So uh, after that, I guess the race was on to find all the fields or all the uh, negative discriminants with class number two. Turns out there's only 18, and somebody managed to prove that stuff. Uh, for three and higher, uh, I think that stuff has been, well, at the time that the main source I took this talk from was, was written, which was like more than 20 years ago, uh, I think they had just, just found all of the fields with class number, all of the negative discriminants with class number three. And uh, I, I'm not sure what the state of the art is today, but at any rate, it pretty much the class number problem has been settled for when delta is negative. When delta is positive, it's still not even known whether there are finitely many uh, deltas with class number equal to one. Uh, there's a lot more than nine. 
that we've already found. Yeah, I, so uh, I think it's, I think most people that know a lot more about this subject than I do would say that there uh, seem to be infinitely many, uh, but we can't even prove that yet. Basically, the fact that we have all this, uh, I mean, the fact that we have this nice picture here has something to do with the fact that this problem is solvable for when the discriminant is negative. Uh, but anyways, I guess that's it. <laughs>